Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And I am really, I know I always say this, I'm always excited. And those that know me know I'm always excited. (laughs) But (laughs) I'm really excited today, especially from Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective, because our very first episode and this is 91 now, so our very first episode, we talked about the power of napping, and then a few podcasts after that, David and I had spoken with a colleague of ours talking about uh, hypersleep and sleeping for an extended period of time and the benefits of that, and today we are speaking with the author, one half of The Mighty Duo. They have written a book, Dreams That Can Save Your Life, early warning signs of cancer and other diseases. And before our guests has gotten on, had gotten on, they were negotiating an audio book, which I'm really excited about because I listen to everything in 2X. So we're going to hear more about that. And this book has been so successful that they've already gotten picked up to move forward with part two. So without further ado, since you're sitting at the edge of your seats, I'd like to introduce Kathleen Cannabis. Welcome to the podcast, Kathleen. Oh, thank you, Hamza and David. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Do you go by Kathleen or Kat? Well, I have everybody kind of introduce me as Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis so they can find my website because you have to have all those names to find the website and it's also on the book as the author. And the reason I did that is because my story is about finding breast cancer three times using dreams is in the book and I wanted to use all of my names, my maiden name and my married name to show that I was standing behind everything that I was saying. But now that you introduced me, you can just call me cat (laughs) (laughs) she's family now she's family of the homies (laughs) well it it was a nice beginning cat in talking about just the reason for doing that and for some people we have some people that you know they want to hear specifically about intrinsic motivation and and we're going to cover a lot of that but you know my backgrounds in business and the way you just explain that introduction from a business standpoint makes sound sound advice for those listening of what they may or may not consider when they're getting their book published just so they can be found amongst like all the noise out there so Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that explanation (laughs) you're quite welcome and you know um a lot of people say well you know your your book is about spirituality basically but the truth of the matter is dreams motivate and guide people in their business decisions as well and so if you are in uh, some form of work or some type of work and you're having nightmares with red flags going up and showing you maybe in a different type of business or a different path on the same business that can be very very important in your life and in your health because when we're not happy emotionally our body starts to break down and our dreams can give us early warning signs of that yeah, sometimes it's it's when like I mentioned in some of our other podcasts, um, especially for the hypersleep, uh, we had mm-hmm. spoken with someone and, and you know we're used to sleeping you know seven to nine hours, which is I guess supposed to be recommended. And David, I, I'll let David talk about his own experience. But when I had tried to, are you familiar with hypersleep at all? I think I am. Do you want to, you know, just in case our audience isn't, do you want to just explain it really quick? Because I'm going to take your podcast and I'm going to put it all over all my social media sites. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Well, for, for those that don't know, for hypersleep, it's, it, you're sleeping the, the regular seven to ten hours, but then what happens is you sh- you're supposed to stay in the bed unless, you, you know, you go to the bathroom or, and have a drink of water and come back. And once your body know, and my, this is my personal experience, once my body knew because you're used to a routine. And so I'm used to, you know, getting up and then, you know, doing what I do. But then when my body knew that I wasn't getting up, I slept for like another 10 hours. And 
I was going, like you were saying, with dreams telling us so many stories, I was able to uncover so much more, and I wasn't even, like, lethargic or anything afterwards after I got to the initial surprise that I could sleep that long. And so I'm not saying for those that are listening, novices, and look, you know, do your research first and, and you know, listen to people like Kat and Dr. Burke, who's her co-author for The Dreams That Can Save Your Life. But for my personal experience, it, it was it was groundbreaking, and, and I guess I'm bringing it up because I need to do it again. That was over a year ago. Uh, what was your experience like, David? Um, that was similar. I, I think I got to about 19 hours before I was like, okay, I have to get up. Um, and a lot of the basis in it, uh, the woman that we interviewed, Avery Alexander, she said this is really about creative levels that people can get into a tap into when they have extended amount of rest and sleep. And she said some of the most creative people get their ideas from when they've been sleeping, dreams, so to speak, your astral space. And so... She does it, I think at the time of the interview, she said she had been doing it for like 20 years, and she does it like once a month, And but she does it for like 48 hours, and so that's something that she had to build up to, but me and Hamza both tried it, and I got to, like I said, about 19 hours before I was like, okay, I have to get up. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I can't sleep anymore, so... Yeah, no, no, and I can see some real benefits to that, because yeah. with hypersleep, when you are first coming out of your eight or nine hours of sleep, you're coming up slowly. And then when you tell yourself to stay in bed in the same position so you can fall back down into sleep, yeah. we suggest that, that, that uh, people do the same thing in order to retrieve dream information. Go back down into your dream in the same position you were in when you woke up. And a lot of times what people will will happen is they'll go into the the hypnagogic level of dreaming and that's where you're going between levels. It's almost like a hallucinogenic type of dreaming and and you see flashes of color you hear words you hear voices and that will take you into another dimension like the fifth dimension of dreaming and it's in that dimension that you can receive so much information whether it's about your work your health uh, deceased loved ones because you're going into another realm it's like the realm between realms it's neither of the living nor of the dead and because that area is on the time continuum there is no past and there is no present there's only the now so those hours just snap by like a nanosecond so yeah it makes a lot of sense to me and a lot of people in the book actually experience that Mm -hmm. yeah i'd like to talk about various levels of, of, of sleep since since you're the expert here uh, one thing I, I do want to get into before we get into your book is uh, hacking. So I'm a, I'm a huge uh, just looking for my best self, right? What's the intrinsic motivation for everything that we do? And one thing, one hack that I, I learned was uh, two different things. I always like the split test. So one was uh, just before going to bed, taking a magnesium pill with a choline pill. And so choline helps you focus but it, 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 it enhanced my lucid dreaming. And then on the other side of that, I would, uh, without taking those pills, those supplements, would, let's say I, for simple math, I went to bed at midnight and I planned to sleep at eight hours. So I would go to bed at midnight, set my alarm for three o'clock, and then turn that alarm off, and then it would kick in my uh, dream state right immediately mm-hmm. afterwards. So are you familiar with any of this uh, biohacking that people are doing for lucidity and accessing their dreams? Um, actually, I have heard about that, uh, and I think it's interesting. Um, although I don't biohack the same way you do, what happens in my dreams and what happens in a lot of people's dreams is when they reach a part reach a a certain amount of hours, whether it's the first three hours or the last two hours, 
their body will wake them up. Their inner guidance will wake them up. Their spiritual guides or the, some a, a deceased loved one will come and wake them up so that at that moment they can write down what they were dreaming about. And then when they go back into the dream, much like what we were talking about earlier, they slide back in. And they often do this, this biohacking you're talking about uh, naturally, but they do it with, um, after setting their dream intention before they go to sleep at night. So basically, they, they set an intention. I want to have an answer to blah, 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 blah. You know, you fill in the blanks. And then you can either set your alarm to wake you up or you can put that in your intention. After four mm-hmm. hours, I want to be awakened so that I can write down what I was dreaming and slide back into that dream possibly to, to get a dream that validates the previous dream. I mean, there's so much that you can do with dreams to get such mm-hmm. deep and relevant information about you. Well, I'm glad we don't have to use the kindergarten class. I guess we can kind of dive right in with you. I think our <laughs> audience is, is versed enough that we don't have to, well, what's dreaming? So <laughs> uh, my question to you is, how do you how do you make sense in the fact that there's a saying that that really resonates with me as uh, things are as the, the way things are as they seem and things are not as they seem and when you're in the dream state there's a lot of whoa I really need to write this down because none of it made sense so how do you, how do you go about uh, interpreting dreams how did you start in where are you where are you now on that scale well there are so many different ways to interpret dreams and it kind of depends on how your dreams are speaking to you because we can have different types of dreams um you know there's really like seven different types of dreams and and they're actually in the book so i don't want to take up the time on your on your show to go through the seven different types but within those types you've also got you know abstract dreams that are using abstract uh, symbols or abstract pictures because you know a picture is worth a thousand words so your 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 dreaming self realizes although it's on the time continuum that has no time and space your body is in the physical realm which which is attached to a clock and so it has to speak to you quickly and most dreams are only three to five minutes long, believe it or not, even though you think you, dream, you dreamt the same dream all night, you really didn't. And so your body starts speaking to you with signs, symbols, and with abstract designs. And sometimes it will actually use a play on words with a picture. Uh, and so what you have to do is start to learn your own dream language that you used when you were a child, when you were, were you know, one, two years old in, in the crib, you were already dreaming and your dreams were speaking to you and you understood them back then because you hadn't learned not to. And that's, that's part of the sad part of growing up. We learn not to listen to our dreams and not to believe in our dreams. But the truth of the matter is our dreams are a part of us. Um, they're a part of our psyche, and they're part of our spiritual guidance. So once we start writing down our dreams by journaling and learning that dream language, we can really, really um, excel everything that we do in life, whether it's our business, our relationships. I mean, let's face it. If you are dreaming that you're walking down the street holding hands with a black widow spider and you're a guy <laughs> that's a pretty big red flag and that yeah. that picture alone is worth a million words let go of the spider and back away from that black creature you know <laughs> stop dating now so you know we we have to kind of learn our dream language and watch for those red flags at the same time if you're getting a green flag flapping in the wind and you're thinking to yourself you know i'm really not going anywhere in this job Why am I hanging around here? Why am I working with these people? Maybe your inner self who on the time continuum knows a little bit more about the future, 
knows that you're going to get a raise in the very near future. You're going to be in a different office, and you're going to be very happy. And so that message might be, hang in there a little longer. It's not a white flag. Don't give up. It's not a black flag. It's a green one. Keep going. So that's where our language, our dream language, is so important. Now, so when you learn your own dream language, so here in... (laughs) I always joke because I have sisters that live overseas. So if they go to Spain or go to France, they can pick up a different language because it's right next door. And we're here in Atlanta, and if I go to Alabama, it's a different (laughs) dialect, right? (laughs) And so it's different. It's a different language, but we all have the same understanding. And and what I'm trying to be light-handed about this is there's a lot of dream books out there that talk about symbols, and on some level, there's an over-reliance on that. And I wanted to get your take since you have to develop your own language and wanted to see if, if you, not you, but euphemistically you, you're, I saw that black widow and that meant that I need to clean the bathroom or something and I may be inter- <laughs> misinterpreting that dream. Right. Well, you know, we're, we're talking about universal symbolism that is in our dreams as well. I mean, I don't know of anybody who would see a black widow spider unless, you know, and again, this is where your, your own personal dream language comes in. If you love black widow spiders and you breed black widow spiders and just looking at a black widow spider to you is the most beautiful thing in the world, then if you're walking down the street with one, it's going to be very different from somebody who would scream and run away. So (laughs) that's where universal symbolism doesn't really fit in that dream. But for the most part, if you're going to get a dream book, a dream dictionary to help you with your dreams, it's, it's usually for what I call universal symbolism. And, and those are the symbols that the caveman put on the caves, you know, on the cave walls. If you saw a round circle with, with lines coming off of it all the way around, you knew that was the sun. If you saw, the, you know, a picture of a crescent moon, you knew it was night. If you saw a cloud with, with lines coming out of it, you knew that was rain. That's universal symbolism. It doesn't matter where you go on this earth. That's what that's going to mean. And so if for some reason you are, are stumped by that, you can get a dream dictionary to help you learn universal symbolism. But chances are, if you look at it long enough, you're going to pretty much figure it out. If you look at the pictures in your dreams, you're going to know, was it daytime? Was it nighttime? Was it raining? Were the streets wet? Um, Who was I talking to? Uh, You know, all of that universal symbolism, you have the answers to. The other things in dreams, for instance, I happen to like snakes. I think snakes are just beautiful. And so um, if I have a snake in my dream, I don't consider it dangerous unless it's a rattlesnake rattling its tail because that's the universal symbolism for danger. Never does a rattlesnake rattle its its tail at you and then go hug you. (laughs) You know, that doesn't happen. (laughs) So that's universal symbolism for beware, you know, don't tread on me, be careful. But on the other hand, when you look at um, ancient Egypt or you, you look at ancient India, the, you know, the kundalini is the giant snake, the giant cobra. So if you have that recurring in your dreams, it's basically, okay, now your dream is shifting. This is your symbol for shifting to a spiritual message. Pay attention. Are you familiar with uh, Bashar, Kat? With the what? I'm sorry, you broke up? With uh, Bashar, the uh, transmission Bashar, David Enka, he, tra- he channels Bashar? No, I'm not. Okay. So the reason why I, I want to bring him up is you had mentioned we're sleep- we're, we think we may be sleeping for, you know, the length of a movie, and you said it was three to five minutes. Mm-hmm. And one thing that he, in some of his messages, they were saying that, yeah, initially it may be three to five minutes because that's all you can retain. I mean, just think of what we try to retain during a day. I mean, I can't live without my phone, and I don't know anybody's number anymore. And so – but he was saying that as the as you get better in interpreting those dreams that they can be longer because where our bodies are being used 
uh, while we are asleep. Like we, we have contracts to do other things outside of what we're seeing on the physical realm when our eyes are open. And I was just wondering as far as uh, you accessing your dreams, if you've been able to transcend on some level outside of maybe a, a day-to-day, uh, it's going to be a great day or stay at your job. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, some of us do exactly what you said. We do dream work at night while we're asleep and we wake up exhausted. <laughs> and mm-hmm. dream work is where we're going into other realms and working on other things. And in, in the book, we talk about dreaming with and dreaming for others, which began about 4,000 years ago in ancient Egypt with Imhotep, the, the um, high priest for the sun god Ra. And people would come to the temple and they would sleep next to the priests on the cold, hard floor. And they would dream together in tandem, doing dream work throughout the night to figure out why this person uh, was having fertility problems, why this person had lost all their money, why this person felt like they had had um, a curse put on them. And, and what we're showing in our modern day book Uh, dreams that can save your life is we had people in the book dreaming for each other in other words we had a mother who would dream her daughter's breast cancer and we would have a daughter who would dream her mother's breast cancer they would take each other to the doctor and boom it was true we would have total strangers in their dream visited by a deceased daughter of a distant, distant friend, and the daughter would tell the person in the dream, my father is going to have a heart attack. This is what's going to happen. Here's a picture of him in the future having that heart attack, and this is the date. And then that woman sending the man an email saying, you know, I know this sounds really bizarre, but I had this dream with your deceased daughter and blah, 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 blah. And the, the, the father reading it and going, well, yeah, you're right. That is really crazy, but thanks so much for checking in. And then when the heart attack started, remembering the email, remembering the woman, remembering the deceased daughter going into that dream and immediately calling 911 before he passed out so that they were able to revive him three times and he lived. That's dream work. And yes, it is much longer than three to five minutes. And when you get to a place in your dream work or in your dreaming where you can write down all the details of a dream, you find that it's seven and eight pages long, which reading it takes more than three minutes. And like I said, you're on the time continuum. So there is no time and there is no space. There's only dimensionality. So let me ask you a, a, a topical question. So in the news the past couple of days, uh, Nash, I'm sure it's national news, so they're talking about this limo accident. And so uh, one could say that they had a dream about a, an accident. They did, it was some kind of vehicle. And so they were like, you know what, I'm going to stay off of buses. And then, um, oh, this limo comes along. Oh, well, I didn't see that limo in the dream, so I jump in the dream, but I still had that accident. Is that a misinterpretation? Is that because it was written in stone and it was supposed to happen for something bigger that they were supposed to learn? I'm just, I just want to get your take from a dream aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say all of the above. Um, you know, if they saw it was white and they avoided all white buses, but they didn't see enough of the dream to realize that it was a limo, maybe they needed to be in the accident for something bigger. If they were alive, still alive, and talking about it, Um, It could be any number of things, maybe to bring to light the power of dreams, the power of how deceased loved ones can come into your dreams and give you precognitive information, information for the future. How can you possibly know that if you haven't been there yet, which again is Einstein's, you know, theory of relativity in the time continuum. So, uh, you know, I can definitely see that happen. And I know that, you know, just before 9 uh, 9-11, people all over the world were dreaming of 9-11. They yeah. were dreaming of it weeks before it happened. 
So we do, when we dream, when we go to sleep at night, we tap into that universal knowledge. And part of that universal knowledge is precognitive. It's what happens in the future because truth be told, how do we know we haven't already all been there once already and come back Mm -hmm. to live again? Um, Yeah, I love, um, and I haven't seen his latest uh, Mission Impossible, but a lot of uh, Tom Cruise's movies, they, they always talk about a lot of the, a lot of the different themes, and I haven't been in the inner sanctums with some of the groups that he's associated with, but I'm sure that some of the subject matter. In one of the movies, he kept dying because he had to figure out the way where he would live, and so there is a school of thought that that's what he, um, what he called deja vu is. Oh yeah, of course I've been here before. I've done this before, and I'm going to do it differently this time. Like, mm-hmm. maybe I've seen the Black Widow, and now I'm going to ignore it finally this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that, that Groundhog Day on a dream level <laughs> or a life level, you know, where you, you know, and many of us uh, reincarnate, if you believe in reincarnation or not, you know, those of you that do, we reincarnate as, as life groups or family groups. So many of the people that we interact with in this lifetime are people we have been in contact with, married to, siblings to, in previous lifetimes, and we had to work something out. We just didn't finish. Uh, We might have been parents to our parents in a previous lifetime, and when we saw where they were going in this lifetime and not accomplishing their goals, we reincarnated back in as a child to keep them on the right path and maybe that path is for them to separate and i've seen a lot of really small children who were actually raising their parents and so i believe that's really happening a lot now what about the other side of that cat where uh, I, I like the another plug for abraham is mm-hmm. you know they always talk about you shouldn't have to croak to fill that bliss. And so uh, if you do croak, right, I mean, since there's eternal life. So if you do croak, then you have to go through this experience of being a child again. i got to learn how to walk. And it's just like, oh, my goodness, it's so long. Uh, are you finding ways? I mean, I guess this is kind of a hacking conversation because if we're retrieving the stream information, maybe we won't have to reincarnate as much and maybe go to this next level. I hear a lot of people say, oh, this is my last time. I'm never coming back. But how many, time, how many other lifetimes have we said that? <laughs> yeah, they probably said it all the other lifetimes as well. You know, when, we, when people don't realize that when we die, we also have to be reborn on the other side. We have to learn how to be a spirit again. And most people don't leave the earth plane for about 90 days. Uh, while they learn how to live without their physical body. It's just like being a baby again. You know, you float through walls. You you don't eat. You you don't really sleep. You don't have to because we eat and we sleep to maintain our physical body. We don't have a physical body on the other side. We're mostly mind and spirit. So you go through the same thing. You learn how to be a spirit again. And after you've done that for so long, so many years, so many generations, it kind of gets boring and you think to yourself, I think I'd like to go back down on the earth and finish up what I didn't finish before. I've been away long enough to forget. It's sort of like when you've been in a bad relationship and the person you split up and the people go in different directions and three years later you run across each other, run across each other and you decide to try it again because you've had enough time to forget the bad stuff. I'm, I, I think there might be some truth to that when we decide to finally reincarnate back down onto the earth plane and, uh, and work with our families and our friends that we knew before again and try to make things right. Or I guess it's a game, like if I have a, a brother or a sister, I learned the lesson and then the next life they learn the lesson. Is, it, is that mm-hmm. what you're saying? Mm -hmm. But we all interact and we learn it together because the truth of the matter is we all come from the same knowledge pool, that universal oneness, that ocean of gnosis is what I talk about. And and I I did see this in in a dream where I saw uh, people dying and their souls almost looked like raindrops and they dropped into this giant ocean. Of, of knowledge that was like water, spirituality, water. And suddenly they knew everything else 
all the other drops knew. And so it was just mind-blowing if you had a mind. But since you were spirit, it was okay. It, you know, you just absorbed it. But, but the point is when we dream, we can tap into that. And that's how Einstein came back with a lot of his information. And a lot of the other brilliant scientists and minds on the earth are able to come back with information. They tap into that ocean of gnosis. And they bring some of that information back with them. They don't bring it all back, but they bring some of it back a step at a time. I mean, look at computers. Look at iPhones. Look at like, a, a, what, 20 years ago, we didn't even have those. We had computers the size of a room. Now we carry it around in our hand. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do like this. Go ahead, David. Yes, Kat. I'd say at this point in time, for you personally, do you, when you, like once you come out of a dream during the you know, middle of the night or whatever, when you go back to sleep, do you go, are you able to go right back to the same scenario or scene that you know that you had just come out of, or is it usually completely a new dream? Uh, sometimes I go right back into the same dream to finish it, and sometimes I shift. Uh, you know that hypnagogic state that I was talking about. It's like you get sucked into yeah. another another dream. Uh, you feel like you're spinning, and there's colors and whooshing noises and nothing you can't really see focus on anything and and sometimes i'll go into another dream i'll shift into a different one go through Mm. another door there's so many dream doors and i always say you know our dream doors are our doorways to the divine because if we go through enough doors and get further away from the earth plane and and the and the pull of the earth and start focusing on 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 you know the other dimensions we can bring back information from the divine we we can connect with our great great grandparents who know us we don't know them but they'll give us information that when we bring back and maybe we we discuss with another family member they'll say oh yeah i remember that from so and so and suddenly you realize you spoke with somebody who's been dead for over 100 years hmm so I think you mentioned it when you were talking a little earlier. Have you ever experienced meeting up with someone in a dream, and then when you saw them again, they had that same recollection of, of me meeting up with them in the dream? Yeah, yeah. The details were like I, I experienced that. It was with someone, and we that was what our intention was. So we kept working on it, and eventually we got to a point where we both remembered the experience that we had, you know, during the dream to the letter. Oh, yeah. Okay, dreaming with others. Yes, yeah, I have done that. Others. I have done yeah. that um, where I uh, told a, a friend of mine uh, that I wanted to be able to enter somebody's dream wow. and say something to them and have them give me something and that I would call her back and this was someone I had never met before and I would call her back and tell her all about my dream and then I wanted her to call the other person and 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 have them tell her if they had met somebody in their dreams and the dream was true and I'd never met this woman I went in my dream to her where she was sitting outside in her garden and she handed me a rose and so it turned out that that woman was actually on Nantucket in her garden and I didn't know she had a home in Nantucket. And in her dream to my friend, she said, I handed this strange girl a yellow rose. Wow. Yeah, the mind is so so powerful. Uh, we had another guest, Yvonne, and uh, she's a medium. And we, we were solving, this is a couple of years ago now, but we were a small group, about five of us, and we were solving cold cases in the middle mm-hmm. of the night through dream work. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's fun when you can access access it with other people. And I guess the other side of that question, it reminds me of, of some other guests where we talked about near-death experiences. And mm-hmm. uniformly, the, those people that had that experience, they were kind of reluctant to come back into the body. I mean, this is third dimension. It's very sloppy and slow and heavy. And have you ever mm-hmm. felt that urge because it's so smooth? I mean, you're, you're unencumbered. And have you felt the draw of staying? Or what's been mm-hmm. your experience, that yeah, experience? Yes, 
It, it, you know what it's very similar to when you've been out of your body for hours and hours when you're dreaming and then you get sucked, that hypnagogic again, sucked back into your body. It's much like when you're in the swimming pool for hours and hours and hours floating around and then you climb out. As soon as you climb out, you feel like you're like, you know, 500 pounds yeah. and then your body has to readjust to, to the gravity of Earth. And so when you're dreaming, you're, you're floating, you're flying, you're free, um, your soul is free. And then when you're sucked back down into your bed, suddenly you feel like you're sucked down into the mattress. I have a personal question. So for me, uh, you know, I have some of this knowledge. Some of it is, you know, book knowledge. Some of it is personal experience. Um, but what I've seen some, on, on some occasions is I may have an intention for something and I want to go to sleep with that intention. The dream is totally different, right? And so I may not even interpret it or even pick it up that it was a dream because I didn't, it wasn't what my original intention was. Mm-hmm. Have you gotten that instance where you may have an intention, but like you said, your higher self can see farther down the road than where you are right now? where you may have had a mixed message and then they put their palm up to their forehead as they often do? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good one. Um, You know, just because you set an intention at night before you go to sleep doesn't mean you're always going to get that that dream answered or that wish answered, you know, wishing upon a star. Sometimes you have to set the intention a couple of times and sometimes you've got to really write it out. And I'll tell people, write it out, read it, because your eyes are the windows to your soul. And your soul is very involved in your dreams, your spiritual self. So you're taking a third-dimensional writing on a piece of paper and you're reading it with fifth-dimensional eyes. And then if you place it under your pillow and sleep on it, you're kind of tying it... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you're tying it all together. And that... Um, can, can be the catalyst for getting you that intention answered. The other thing is this. When you set an intention, sometimes what you're doing is you're putting something in motion and you've got to give it time to play out. Sometimes it won't play out that night. It might take a few weeks to get things going and, and, and working and shifting, and then you'll get the dream. And you'll know as soon as you do, you'll get, oh, yeah, that was, that was my intention from a week ago, and now I'm getting the answer. What well, took that long for all of your spirit guides and, and maybe your deceased loved ones to start working their magic on the other side? Thank you for that answer. It, it makes me, it reminds me of when I was an undergrad, I had a, a job offer to work with the Peace Corps. And I had taken the psyche vow, what have you. And they were like, you are a capital, 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 A++. And they're like, we don't think you may, it will be a good experience for you. And I'm like, why? This would be good on my resume. I was a totally different person at this time. So anyway, I was like, it would be good on my resume and all this. And so they were saying that, uh, and it was going to Ghana. And so they were like, well, Hamza, if you set up a meeting, let's say tomorrow at 830, you might be there, you know, a little early, 8 o'clock, whatever, and get highly upset if they don't, they won't show up until like maybe eight that night or maybe eight, three days from now. And uh, I wanted to share that story because I think we have our, that third dimension demand instead of letting things flow. And when we stepped away from that dream, that's how I'm interpreting the message you just gave me. When we have that intention, we want it done tomorrow. But when we Mm -hmm. walked away from it and let it go, then it gave it, we gave it time subconsciously to work itself out maybe that week or two later. Exactly. And that's called dream incubation. Okay, so you can set your intention. Just think of it as dreaming, uh, kind of laying your dream egg. <laughs> and then you've got to incubate it. You've kind of got to keep it in the back of your mind, keep it alive, keep it warm, and give it the opportunity to hatch. Does that, does that make any sense? No, it makes total sense. It's more of, I guess, the <laughs> old so one. It was quiet on the other end. I was like, oh, boy, I really lost him on this one. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what is he thought? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Like, <laughs> Charlie Brown's teacher. 
And the old one, the old example, I guess, was the the secret that you know most people were introduced to. I guess this type of uh, this type of information. And the example used was: we don't go to a restaurant and walk into the kitchen with them and watch them cook. We order and then we go about our business and have conversations, and then the meal comes. We don't have to watch over it because because we have the understanding that it will come and it's in the right time. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, that's all part of, you know, the incubation. It, it's going to show up at the right time, at the right moment. And, again, because we are, we are tied to time on the earth plane, we have to wait till the time is right. Even though you may get the information and it may be working on, in the fifth sixth or seventh dimension we don't know what dimension it's working in but it's like the clouds are all coming together and the winds have to be blowing right over there at the same time they have to be blowing at the right moment the right time here so it's really complicated and the fact that it ever even works is amazing and yet it does Mm -hmm. Uh, i think i mean imagine imagine dreaming dreaming that you know in my case i'll just speak in my case i'm dreaming a regular dream and suddenly that dream freezes like a window on your computer and that window turns into a door and through that door from another dimension maybe a fifth sixth seventh dimension walks a monk and this really did happen in my dreams and that monk says come with me we have something to tell you and drags me through those dream doorways into the divine into the future and says you have breast cancer do you feel this right here takes my hand puts it on my breast and says can you feel this and and i said yeah and they said that's breast cancer you go back to your doctor tomorrow and get a second set of tests took me three and a half months to finally get um exploratory surgery which is what i needed and that exploratory surgery showed stage two aggressive breast cancer now how could i possibly have known that and been really self-advocating for additional testing i mean who wants to keep going to the doctor and beg to be cut open unless you really Mm. know there's something there and that's because all the other dimensions were coming into our third dimension through the dream doors now it's my understanding that with disease it, disease is happening because there's you know something unfulfilled spiritually like it could be unfulfilled work or just anger issues or um, things like that one reference point that I really like is uh, you can heal your life by Louise Hay and it was like oh I, I keep having this pain in my in my hand and it, you know I, it was referenced to some universal symbolism that you're talking about mm-hmm. and now that you had that story you had that dream were you able to actually go back maybe, you know, in a, from a timeline standpoint, maybe three months or six months or a year and see this is where my life was going and I was probably getting messages all along, but it took this one monumental dream to actually shake me and pay attention? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that I was getting – I don't think previously it was having dreams to that effect but um, you know my life changed drastically after that because up until that time the biggest uh, the biggest uh, thing I had to consider in the morning when I got up was what tennis outfit I was going to put on to go play tennis and then where I was going to go with my friends for lunch and suddenly after being diagnosed with breast cancer three times in three different dreams with these monks um the third time i was so angry when they showed up in my dream i was just really mad and when they showed up i said you know what did i ever do to deserve this what what could i possibly have done in a previous life to be so mean awful horrible that i would be tortured like this in this life and uh the monks looked at me and they said don't you remember and i said remember what They said, you told us before you were born into this lifetime that you wanted at this time to come down onto the earth plane and show the world that science should not be, um, should should not be people's God. You, You do not, uh, you, you do not believe in science like a god 
science is a gift from God. You believe in God. And so what you are showing the world is science goes so far, it's fallible, but then comes God. And you, we told you we would be with you every step of the way, and we have. And I said, oh, my God, what was I smoking up there? I must have been out of my mind. And it was the only time I ever saw them laugh. Wow. So it was my destiny. You know, you talk about that dream work, the working that we were doing. It's my destiny to use the dreams to build the bridge between spirituality and modern medicine. They were going so far into science that we're forgetting that we're spirits in a human body having a physical experience on the earth plane and when you when you heal the body you must also use the spirit as part of that healing so if you take dreams and and you work with your dreams at the same time you're working with chemotherapy or anything else you have a much better chance of surviving anything, no matter how bad it is. And my recurrence was 9 by 11 centimeters. It was terminal. And I'm still here. Now, the, the Annie room is always funny when we, you know, get with our soul groups before we incarnate. <laughs> and I, I think the saying is that since we're not in the third dimension yet, we just have that laundry list. Like, yeah, throw that on and put extra cheese on that. Oh, of course. Drinks for everybody. <laughs> and then when you're in Carter, you're like, I signed that? I'm not signing that tab. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you say that, but the other side is that um, third dimension is, is dealing with polarities, hot, cold, and science or spirituality. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit about how you're able to start merging these together. Uh, you have this book. It's been successful. You, you ha- I want you to talk about you know, where it's headed next because there's some exciting things that's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, we're actually, just, just before I came on the show with you, I was on uh, um, a conference call with my agent and uh, the uh, publisher, Inner Traditions, Simon & Schuster, uh, contacted her to have us sign a contract for an audio book, which was not in our original contract because this is our first real book. And they never believed the book. I guess they didn't think the book would do as well as it is. And so they are in the process of, of making an audio book for it. And it's available on Amazon and, and now, but the book is also available in, in bookstores ac- across the country because it is doing so well. But Dr. Larry Burke, who is, is a radiologist at Duke University, is actually starting his second research project with women uh, who have breast cancer who are coming in for radiation therapy and treatments. And uh, he's researching dreams that diagnose their illness before they went to the doctor. So we, um, you know, we're getting ready to do this second book and we're putting all of our, we're pulling all the dreams together, and it's amazing how many stories we already have. And the only ones that I really would like to be able to add to the book, and I haven't gotten yet, are men who had breast cancer and had dreams that diagnosed their breast cancer. Um, I think that that is a forgotten uh, part of our our world and our population, and I'd like to have them in that book as well. I'd like, since we have this audience in this moment right now, since you're working with a, a radiologist, it'd be interesting to just look at the, the back uh, of everything that, that we eat from a male standpoint, uh, <laughs> because it, it was quite surprising when it was brought to my attention. There's a lot of soy and a lot of foods that you wouldn't think would have it, and it's associated with uh, you know estrogen, and, and that mm-hmm. potentially could, I'm not saying it's the end-all, be-all, but it could potentially point to men having issues with breast cancer. I'm not sure. I'm just saying mm-hmm. on your side, you're probably, you're on the ground floor, so you're probably seeing things then outside of a, a civilian as myself. Well, you know, um, breast cancer takes a real long time to develop. It takes about 10, 15 years. We had the cells, the cells are there, and then they're stimulated by whatever. And I really believe that 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of hormones in our foods. There was in, mm-hmm. you know, in meat, it was in chickens, it was in milk, it was in eggs. It was in everything. And I think that what's happening is now we're seeing 
the, the, the byproduct of that, which is um, breast cancer in men, estrogen uh, reactive breast cancer in men, because they were eating the same foods. And you can also almost see that in the Asian culture. Uh, the Asians were very tiny people um, without big breasts. And then when they come to the United States and they start to mm. eat American food, uh, mm. they start to, to grow larger breasts. When women start to grow larger breasts, they get taller. Uh, and so it's, I, I really do believe it, it's food-related. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, a whole other podcast in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to ask you from from that standpoint, uh, from you, you marrying the dream world and, and working with a radiologist, uh, when you work with the subjects, or I'm thinking of when I had to get tested for CPAP, and and so you know I'm I'm hooked to a, a million different um, devices. Are you measuring brain activity when a person comes in to? Oh no! Oh, this this is when this person's dreaming, and it, it'll they can set an intention of of actually retaining a dream better. Or how's it working from the medical side? Well, we um, Dr. Larry Burke does not does not do that. He's doing radiology uh, as it pertains to breast cancer, or or yeah. reading um, uh, radiology. Uh, so we're not he's not really doing testing on brains however during during sleep however i have read some of the different research that has been done on the brain not the mind but the actual organ the brain during sleep and what i found really interesting and i, I wrote a big article about it in biz catalyst 360 um you can go there to, to find it if you want but uh, when we are awake, we use about 10% of our brain. Some of us, if we're really, really smart, might use like 11 or 12%. But when we sleep, we use 100% of our brain because a lot of the areas of our brain that are not working while we are awake are working while we're asleep to keep our body from moving, to keep our, our body going, uh, us breathing, things like that in our sleep. So it's amazing when we're asleep, we're actually more alive and awake mentally than when we are awake. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but I thought it was pretty I think it, darned amazing. It does, and you probably have heard this too, that um, you're dead a lot longer than you are alive. So <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it makes sense. We spend most of the time there, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think that's where the in all seriousness, where the drop-off happens, because you, we have a lot of accidents that are they look DUI related because there's no no um, breakage in a car or what have you, and, and, and it's because of sleep deprivation. You know, working two three jobs, single parent, uh, all the stresses of life, and so because you're not getting that rest, that's where uh, accidents happen. And so, you know, you, I guess we're stressing the importance of dreaming, not just for uh, the wonderful in information that we're getting, but just for survival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, when we're sleep deprived, um, you know, we, it's almost like that's when a lot of daydreaming happens and you have accidents. It's because mm -hmm. our brain must go play. Our brain must connect with the universe. It must. It's just as, it, it's food for the soul. Just as we eat, you know, uh, you know whatever it is, we're, our, our, our breakfast, lunch, and dinner for our body, dreams are for our soul, and it's the way our soul reconnects with universal oneness, with that ocean of gnosis that we talked about earlier, but also with spirit guides, with deceased uh, family members whom we knew before we were even born. So it's like we go home, and we have to go home. It's just absolutely necessary that we go home. Now, before you go home, <laughs> what, mm -hmm. is there a specific arrangement that you have when you go to bed? That, you know, there's arguments of total darkness, no night lights or any of that. Does that help? Um, I personally use the blinders, like, you know, on the airplane. Uh, are, mm -hmm. are you finding that you get a, a better sleep and that you're able to dream better that way? Or is there a particular environment that you're getting the maximum result? 
Um, actually, I just wrote another article about that. Are you sure you haven't been in my dreams at night? <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote an article about that with uh, using, you know, four ways to trick your mind, trick your body into falling asleep and staying asleep so you can dream. And one of them is to, to uh, you know, turn off any extra lights that are in your room, like the blue lights that might be on your TV, the blinking blue lights, your phone, if you've got your phone next to your bed, turn it over, flip it over so that if you get a message or a text, it doesn't light up the whole room because you'll be able to see it through your eyelids. And another thing is to drop the temperature in your bedroom. Make sure your bedroom is two to three degrees cooler than the rest of the house because the body drops down then almost like into hibernation and you dream better, and you sleep better, and you stay asleep longer. And then, of course, don't eat or drink before you go to sleep, at least two hours before bedtime, you know. All the things our parents told us when we were little before we went to sleep, so you don't wake up and have to pee, you know, because then once you get up and you walk across the room and you sit down on a cold toilet seat, whatever dream you had was gone. You're now in a nightmare. You know, your butt's cold and you've got to go to the bathroom. So, um, yeah, just... Uh, those, I, I think those are three of the most important things. Uh, make sure it's dark enough for you to fall asleep. And if you're having trouble falling asleep and you want to trick your mind into helping you get to sleep, just repeat mantras over and over again. You know, it, whether it's the Lord's Prayer, um, Mary had a little lamb, you know, you pick whatever it is. If you just keep repeating it, your mind's going to go, oh, my God, this is so boring. I'm going to go dream. Boom. <laughs> that kind of the same principle and uh, when people say count sheep, same thing yeah. just get bored. Yeah. Yeah. Your mind goes, Oh, this is boring, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I was talking about hacking earlier and, and one thing I'm I'm proud to say, I, I think I'm about I stopped counting, but I think I'm about sixty days without having a Fitbit. I actually, you know, sans Fitbit, I took it off. And one of the things with regards to um, Fitbits is, or any of these tracking devices, is like you said, that that uh, radiation. And one one um, suggestion or instruction when having a Fitbit was, uh, you wanted to track. I wanted to track my sleep patterns. So I wanted to see if I was snoring or how long I was snoring or how many times I tossed and turned. So you put the 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 phone under your pillow. And so the argument was, well, put it on airplane mode because you don't want that radiation close to your head. But while you're awake, you're going to have that radiation throughout the day. So Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, uh, in the future, I know you talked a little bit about breast cancer, but are you looking at um, brain cancer as well? Uh, Well, we, we do have a couple of stories in the book about brain cancer. Um, but, you know, it wasn't like the, the – it looked like a pancake. It didn't look like a cell phone. So I know that there are some cases where they are finding brain, brain cancer that does look like a cell phone. So there might be something to that, or maybe there isn't. But I think that there is definitely some research that could be done on that and whether or not people are having dreams to the fa- to, to, to the fact that, you know, your brain – cancer looks like a cell phone that was that or if they're walking around in their dream talking on a cell phone up to their ear and the and the voice coming through their cell phone is saying you've got brain cancer from this cell phone i i would love to hear that so if any of your audience had anything similar to that uh you can email me at catcan k-a-t-k-a-n at comcast dot net And if you've had a precognitive dream or a dream that told you you had an illness or a dream that saved your life, send it to me. I'd I'd love to hear about it. And if you want to keep an update on on the second book that's coming out, go to my website, which is Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis. That's K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-O-K-E-E-F-E-K-A-N-A-V. OS.com and take a look at what's going on. I am going to be on CBS News, I think it is the 26th, right before Halloween, talking about bats and spiders and webs and black cats uh, in dreams for Halloween. And I'm also going to be on Riddit.Dreams on the 20th. So you can go to Riddit and ask me anything, a.k.a.
Nice, very nice. Uh, with the last question with regards to group think and collective consciousness, are, are there any plans to do like a Facebook group where people can collectively share our dreams? Oh, sure. We, you know, I, I do my podcast, my video podcast on my Facebook page, which is Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis again. And a lot of times we're talking about dreams. I have dreamers on there talking about their dreams. Uh, many of the dreamers from the book come on there also. So if you would like to do that with me sometime, let's, let's make that happen with your audience Absolutely. and my audience. Oh, that'd be an audience. That'd be an awesome audience, wouldn't it? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. <laughs> okay, let's make that happen. Yes, that yes, would be indeed. fun. <laughs> yes, indeed. And everybody well, would have... to see us. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure, uh, Kat, and uh, you have definitely been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. Kat, we definitely have to stay in touch. Congratulations and accolades for the audio book. And the second book, we'd love to have both you and Dr. Burke back. Okay. Well, we'll make that happen too. Thank you so much for having me on your show, guys. I had a great time. Yes, thanks for being here. Thank you. Ciao. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.